there have been definitely periods where I mean I seem to have periods where things really succeed and then there'll be a, there'll be a bunch of failures in between and I think that it's okay you know I'm really happy that um, there are some failures but you're not really allowed failures anymore like we uh, friends and I have talked about this especially as filmmakers or video makers you not you have to kind of keep churning out it's very hard to make work and then you have to churn it out regularly and then you also have to not have any you know bad work in between or mm-hmm. you just sort of get discounted um, and it's just pressures in terms of the field and funding and you know who, who gets shown this kind of thing it's, it's interesting to think about when you know that you failed or not I mean when when that kind of occurs to you um, with your work and and I think that it's sometimes really hard to know um, you know it's always the kind of thing where when you're at the opening or you've just shown a piece how people respond right away you know it's, it's always an indicator of like are they uncomfortable and running out of the room really quickly <laughs> you know <laughs> or are they actually engaging and talking to you about the work yeah. um, and you know, I've been in both those situations, you know, so after, over time you begin to recognize when something is kind of working and when it's really not. It's really uncomfortable when it doesn't work. It's super uncomfortable. Because I think all of this stuff with making work is puts your oneself, myself, on, on the line. You're on the line. You're very exposed. It's different from any other kind of practice, I think. And, so it's just really interesting when it flops. I do have very specific audiences for my work, I think. Um, <clears throat> I think some of my earlier work was really f- you know, feminist driven, and so I think that a lot of that work had a, a primarily was of interest to women. Um, then as I started to move into work about um, animals and kind of communicating with animals and interspecies communication and collaborations, um, that opened up a whole different audience. Now that I'm also working in kind of biology and art, um, that's a really specific audience. <laughs> I mean, you know, because, and it's also, again, a different audience because it's beginning to talk more with scientists and actually try to bring scientists into this discussion that you're having, um, which I think is really, really interesting because um, I think that at the more interesting work for me is work that's beginning to speak interdisciplinary in, in an interdisciplinary way and kind of cross between um, different fields and then you really open up your audiences and you begin to bring people in. It doesn't always work. Some of my work in the bio art stuff talks to um, some people and then other scientists are really pissed off about it, you know, because it's, it's talking about uh, kind of having a great empathy for science lab animals, you know, and, and it's not necessarily something that, um, not that scientists don't have empathy for those animals, but I think they think like, you know, you're not, I, I'm not looking at the full picture of what their research represents and things like that, because yeah. I'm coming at it from such a different angle. Yeah. Um, Do you think that your work has influenced change in the, the science world or the research world in some way? I don't, I don't know that work ever affects any real change. I think that it starts a conversation. And if it can start a conversation that somebody actually engages with, then that's a kind of success. I don't think that much of my work will survive like in millenniums, you know, like hundreds of years from now. I don't anticipate my work necessarily being around because I've always thought of it as being kind of ephemeral. And so I don't have a sense of wanting it to be preserved, you know, for history, for historical reasons. Do you think that work is a success if it is preserved? Not okay, necessarily. Push this, this I think it's really random what gets preserved and what doesn't. And I think it's okay. It's the same with anything, any history that we look at. <laughs> How do you think, um, in the current economic climate, the difficulty of survival sort of plays in with you know, the successes for artists? I wish there was more funding because when I was oh, shoot. Um, Wait a, minute. We got a, big disaster. a little bit younger, there was more funding available. Um, so I wish there were more, was more funding available for people. But on the other hand, I have to say that I don't think um, it'll hurt. I don't. I think it'll. People will still be making work, and I think people will make very strong work in these kinds of periods because people are struggling so much that they really push um, and have a lot to say. You know, because there's a lot of issues that need need strong kind of responses now. The problem though with not having any funding available 
is that it does art art practice can become a kind of privileged thing to do, mm-hmm. you know, because only certain people are going to be able to afford to do it um, and have it exhibited in the art realm. I don't think I don't think that I have success in the art world. Um, you know, I'm not one of these people who had it when I was like 20. You know, I mean, I've worked and worked and worked, and I love the work, so it's okay. I think that probably along the way, if um, I hadn't gotten some successes, you know, I don't know if I would have kept going or not. When I was really young, and um, I had I had saved my money to go to this art summer art kind of art camp in in France, and um, they had they had stone carving sculpture as part of it. It was very romantic because you were this was in the southern part of France, and you went to a quarry. In the side of a mountain, it was in a small 17th century village, and that's where you did your stone carving. I was in the middle of some sculpture, really bad sculpture, I have to say, <laughs> of like a Madonna type of ca- woman, you know, some sea creature or something, really awful. And and there was because we were working with limestone, it had all of these kind of inherent cracks and, and fissures in it, so it broke right in the middle. And I remember just looking at it and being like furious. <laughs> And I picked up one half of it, and I just threw it across the quarry, just randomly picked up whatever was right in front of me. And then I was left with the other half, and I was like, fine, I'm making something out of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I made this sculpture, which was completely abstract. I'd never worked with anything abstract before. I was very kind of narrative-driven and all this. And it was the big success of the season. Like the professor thought this was the cat's ass, you know, of, of all the of all of the sculptures and, you know, I was really proud of it. I was like, yeah, look at that, you know? And it, p- it came purely out of a mistake. I mean, literally. So if it hadn't been for that whole event, I think I would have been much more wary of like mistakes and things in my future. But from that one incident, I was like, okay, Let's try and embrace these things because I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't have time to think. I just reacted. Yeah. So that's you know one story I can remember of when a failure kind of worked in my favor. There haven't always. It hasn't always been that way. <laughs>